Hey, I got a question for you. Are you feeling like you're losing your memory from a lot of social media and just the twitchiness of modern culture, the notifications and the jumpy images and everything just constantly, constantly, constantly screaming for your attention. If so, it may be causing digital amnesia and there is a cure for this. Dropping cards here on the floor. There's a cure for it and uh, you know, we can get down to it. We can really, really help ourselves by doing a few simple things that I want to talk about on today's live video. And uh, if you are hopping onto this call and you're not subscribed to this channel, Whoops, there's that card I dropped. Um, <laughs> please hit that subscribe button and hit the bell, hit the thumbs up if you're joining. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking, how you feel about social media. Is it destroying your memory? And you know, what are you gonna do about it? What are you doing about it? What contingency measures do you have in place? We're gonna talk about digital amnesia. It's real, it's a problem, it's something that we need to work together to solve. And uh, there are some simple solutions, solutions that I promise are simpler than memorizing cards. Now, memorizing cards, of course, is a good thing, and I get a lot of questions about memorizing cards. And, uh, you know, if you're here and you want to ask some questions, then by all means, please do. Uh, we may uh, save them for a little bit later, but I really appreciate everybody being here and letting me know you're engaged with your thumbs up. And first of all, I'd like to... Uh, cover a nice message that I got from someone named Karen who says, uh, Dear Dr. Metivier, first of all, I'd like to say thank you so much for your efforts and commitment to this most versatile, practical, fun-giving, magnetic memory method. I've subscribed to your four-part free video course at the beginning of this month and been systematizing the method since then, which contributes in so many ways to my language and pedagogy learning and exam preparation. Especially to me, it is a real honor to get to know the magnetic memory method. The reason is I have no eyesight. This is so interesting. So I have no knowledge about colors, lights, images, and whatever visual that are considered vital and fundamental in learning mnemonic skills. Lucky for me, this approach is tolerant to other senses as well as sight. Also, your YouTube videos, blog posts, and podcasts are tremendously helpful in that you explain and describe memory improvement skills and magnetic memory method principles so elaborately I can get a grasp of just about everything without a waste of time to struggle with what I have no clue how to make out with. Anyway, isn't that nice? I, uh, I've always been asked many, many times about how a, a person who cannot see could use memory techniques and uh, so now I have uh, some lovely correspondence from with someone who is very interested in it anyway she uh, goes through some questions which we'll pick up here in a minute and I want your questions here on the live I saw somebody uh, uh, posted something I don't think Twitter is the reason that I can't remember what I ate on the 7th of March 2005 that's from Planet Sim well Planet Sim maybe not but it could be the reason why you don't remember some of the information in a book for an exam that you need to read because there's solid evidence out there that we are not able to read from digital ebooks or sorry we're not able to memorize from digital ebooks as well as we can from uh, physical books and it, it, some of this research is new it still needs more testing and so forth, but I think that a lot of people, and a lot of people come to me, uh, they come to me and they have this experience, that, and they say, yeah, you know what, I really am not memor remembering things as well from digital books, and why is that? And one of the reasons why is because, oh, and by the way, a shout out to this book, I had a shout out to it on the last live, uh, Skeptic by Michael Shermer, he talks about the royal road to reality, which is science, but one of the things is, is when we're reading books, books are location-based entities, so um, they are space, right? Well, where is page 72 in an ebook? Your mind has less to capture on, latch onto in a spatial sense. So I'm really, really interested in that relationship. Again, this is speculation. I'm not going to talk about, uh, you know, science that I, I haven't uh, done tests for, but I would love the funding to run certain tests because I have ideas for tests. But the point is that 
books are physical locations in ways that e-books aren't and our memories latch on to that. Um, another book I'll shout out to that's really interesting you might want to pick up the 13th story a tree house and this is a book that's filled with locations and it will exercise your spatial memory and I don't think it would look very good or work very good as an ebook which could cause <laughs> digital amnesia which we're talking about now um, and uh, it is absolutely an amazing amazing book mental exercise for figuring, imagining locations. And so when people talk about virtual memory palaces, memory palaces from movies, memory palaces from games and so forth, this is a cool book to explore for that. And uh, it's neat because in the series, book after book after book, the treehouse, and I'm just guessing because I haven't read past uh, this one yet, but uh, the treehouse seems to get taller and taller and taller, which means that if you were to read the whole series, your spatial memory of the treehouse could grow and this would be imaginary spatial memory rather than real spatial memory. Anyhow, if you're hopping on the call and you haven't had said hello yet, please do, and I'm going to catch up with uh, uh, comments that may have come in here. So Planet Sim, yeah, I get your humor, but we are talking about a serious issue here, and Twitter might be responsible for more than you think. It's part of the twitchy culture that we live in where people are just reacting, and look, there's a madman out there, well, actually, lots of madmen out there who are causing people to have reactions in a very, very fast way. But can you remember the last thing that Trump tweeted? Can you? Can you remember the last two things, the th last three things? Can you remember them five minutes later? Is that causing forgetfulness? Well, apparently, because somehow the guy got voted in, right? And he did a whole lot of tweeting. So we can talk about forgetfulness in a very, very wide sense, but you know, I like your joke, but it's uh, a lot more serious than that. And uh, we need to we need to uh, to see the humor in what you're saying, but we also need to see the deadly seriousness of what's going on with uh, things like that when it comes to Twitter. So Twitter is causing somebody to forget certain things, like uh, not uh, either to uh, vote or not vote, whatever they did. Nicholas is here. Hi, Anthony. Guten Tag aus der Schweiz. Oh, Nicholas, this is gut. Uh, dass du hier bist. Oh, mein Deutsch ist oh, irgendwie gebrochen. Es ist sieben Monate jetzt, dass ich nicht regelmäßig Deutsch gesprochen habe und ich fühle es sehr. Und uh, yeah, I was interviewed auf Deutsch recently and I just think, oh man, I gotta start speaking German more because it's coming slower and slower and uh, with all my focus on Chinese. <laughs> In any case, this is one of the things with language. I mean, one of the things we discovered on the uh, podcast was that, uh, I mean, my German was okay, I, I, I think, I warmed up to it as we were speaking, but uh, uh, just this vocabulary that I have is, 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 is intense for, for, uh, for German, but uh, not speaking it regularly, um, or as regularly as I used to, and now I'm just reading daily, listening to German music, listening to some German podcasts and so forth. Um, it's not the same as speaking every day. So your muscle memory goes fast when you have learned a language or are learning a language and aren't practicing it. It actually seems to me to go faster than your arm muscles when you're not going to the gym. These seem to be lasting longer when you're, uh, when you're away. So I wanna hear from y'all uh, where you're at in the world and what your feelings are about the internet and social media and how it's affecting your memory, if at all. If it isn't, and we just want to make jokes about uh, how Twitter is not forgetting, uh, uh, or not not causing us to forget what we ate for breakfast, then we can do that. But uh, you know, I think it's a it's a super super serious thing, and um, it's it, it's so interesting when you look at what people are saying. Yeah, I saw this post, and then they'll say, "What?" who wrote it, uh, what was it about, and so forth. Now, we don't want to make, uh, we don't want to engage in fallacy and say that that never happened before the internet. Um, Magus is here from Paris. Oh, so great to, to, to have you here, Magus. Bonjour, bonjour. Comment ça va? Um, I just, uh, uh, I think that we, 
have the thing, and we've seen, I don't know if you've ever seen that, let me know if you've seen that image of uh, all the men in the train reading newspapers, their heads buried in newspapers, and I believe next to it they had pictures of people lost in their cell phones, and it was, you know, nothing has changed. And uh, so I don't want to romanticize the past and say that somehow media in the past encouraged us to remember more. But somebody today asked me, they, I was saying, you know, you got to read the, the Iliad. And, and, you know, Plato was talking about how you got to read the Iliad and yada yada, or not read the Iliad, as the case may be, depending on how you interpret certain parts of the things. And the person just looked at me and said, have you read the Iliad? And I said, you know, Apuleius, son, Achilles, sing, O muse, the de or sing, O muse, the vengeance deep and deadly, whence to Greece, unnumbered ills arose. And uh, yeah, I have, actually. And I think it is good for your brain. I think it is good for your memory. It's great stuff to memorize. And uh, it's just uh, amazing. Let me try that again. I was trying to think of one thing and recite another thing. Of Achilles... Uh, a Peleus son, Achilles, sing, O muse, the vengeance, deep and deadly winds degrees, unnumbered ills arose. I always love this memory stuff while you're trying to deliver uh, a talk on YouTube. I think it's really, really hilarious because you're trying to remember stuff and then you're trying to say stuff and it's, it's kind of cool. It's kind of cool uh, a memory exercise. So give it a try sometime. Hop on YouTube Live and uh, <laughs> recite from memory. You know, I, I, I really love all the great memory people who put their ass on the line and actually show what what show their stuff it's kind of cool planet sim says what do you think about digital learning apps like duolingo uh let me see here i learned several i learned several months french with duolingo and i forgot lots of words since i stopped learning yeah well i never name any particular app a great question by the way planet sim i really appreciate it and uh, for those of you who are hopping on, please uh, let me know where you are in the world. Hit that thumbs up to let me know you're engaged. Um, planets, uh, Sim, the thing with, with these apps is that they are not really learning a language. I think that they are learning the parts of a language in an app environment. So I've done a lot of experiments with different ones. And one of the really interesting effects is that I'll do really well with them when I'm on the app. But when I'm not on the app, where's the words that I memorize? I mean, it's just, it's, it, you're training yourself to build fluency while you're using an app. So it's not as if it doesn't help you build core vocabulary, but it doesn't create the use of vocabulary in the same way that memorizing poetry isn't the same as reciting poetry, because it's, a, it's it's the same memory skill differently. Different. Um, Planet Sim says, I can say that my pants are red in French. Well, yeah, and you know, that's uh, one of the great uh, criticisms of these programs is like, yeah, you can learn some stuff, but who cares if your cat eats cheese, you know? Like, <laughs> so part of the thing that I think about that is, that, first of all, it may well encourage a kind of memory but just one kind of memory and it encourages accuracy in a context and it can be very very rewarding and we got opioid systems in the brain uh, but I think that that also encourages in many cases pain from the insular cortex when you actually have to go out in the world and use the language because you know using the language is actually it's its, its own skill which is why I wrote a book called The Ultimate Language Learning Secret to help people figure out this skill of like how you actually start speaking a language and how you gradually get yourself to more and more confidence so that you can do it more and more and more and just open your mouth and speak, right? So, you know, today in the elevator, I started talking to these Chinese guys and they were too shy to have a conversation with me, but it was fine. The other day, yesterday, I was talking with a woman and I tried not, tried not to talk to too many women in the elevator because I think my wife will worry that uh, I'm flirting with people, right? But in any case, I was chatting up with her and so forth and just it, every time it's the same kind of thing like, oh, I got to practice and, you know, I'll, you, you have this inner resistance. So how do you overcome the inner resistance? 
Well, first of all, if you know a little bit about how your brain works, your insular cortex is creating pain, and it, it doesn't want you to do these things. Other parts of your brain want you to preserve energy and so forth, and you know, shyness and yada yada yada. And this is all just chemicals. It's not even reality, right? Because no one cares. That person's gonna forget you two minutes after she's out the door or he's out the door. Right? So what would it matter if you sounded like an idiot or you made a mistake or whatever? And uh, sometimes I have these little exchanges with people for 30 seconds and I just say to them, hey, you know, I love to practice, thank you very much. And even if it's just like, hey, do you speak Chinese? How are you today? And uh, where are you from? And so forth. I mean, it's an opportunity to practice and each and every individual person is a person that is a way to practice the language that you can't have unless you practice it with that person because every encounter is its own situation and elicits makes possible different things that you might want to say and if you can't say it then you can figure out and remember hey I wanted to say something but I didn't know what it was and then you go to your italki teacher or you go to whoever you can or to a dictionary or to a phrase book or whatever and you figure out what it was that you wanted to say you memorize it and then the next time you got it and you can practice it so by not being out there and speaking you're robbing yourself of the best language learning teacher there is which is the situation in which you didn't know how to say something remember what you didn't know how to say then go figure out how to say it and then say it the next time so if you're not doing that all the apps in the world aren't going to help you and you can talk about red pants until you're blue in the face but if you're not talking about hey you know if you're learning French if you're not talking to somebody and you're like hey uh, this crazy app taught me how to say that my pants are red you're missing out you're really missing out so thank you for that question I really really appreciate it and I think that it's worse than that the apps and time spent in the apps are causing a kind of forgetfulness, but rather they're training us to be fluent inside of our heads with bad phrases, with vocabulary that often we can't use, and it doesn't help us actually find the vocabulary that we could be using, that we should be using, because it's the vocabulary and the phraseology that's important to us in the context that we're actually in, in the world, right? which is where things happen. And this doesn't just have to do with language learning. It has to do with expertise in any area in which one might want to become an expert. You want to become an expert with cards, with card magic? You go out and you perform magic tricks. And if you want to do memory exercise, you perform with memorized card decks. There's a fluency of magic, a performance fluency of magic, which if you want to use memory techniques, you practice it and you go out there and you do it and you get it sorted and you get better and better and better. It's really, really fun and amazing and easy and uh, it's just great. It's just great. And there's reasons, we know the reasons why some people don't do it, but there's no person on the planet who has a reason or an excuse why that they shouldn't be able to accomplish all these great feats. It's just that if they're not doing these things, they're they, they probably have a stronger pain response for whatever reason. If you want to get mo motivated and, and going and moving forward, then really it's just taking one step at a time and the most practical thing that you can do is learn something, then use it. And use it in the most, uh, I, how, do you, how would you say this? In the most consequence-free way, context. You know, when I've, needed to practice certain things you just practice them by yourself and then if you need to uh, practice a speech in front of people and you're really nervous and so forth well then instead of just going out and practicing in front of people practice in front of your goldfish and then practice in front of your dog and then practice in front of your family and tell them look I'm kind of nervous and I want to like practice not being nervous so please no comments just be humans that are there and uh, save your comments for the end or have them fill out a sheet so that you don't have to hear their comments verbally or whatever but there's always a way there's always a way and you can find a way if you want to do something really really interesting so um, let me know where you are in the world if you're uh, just hopping on thank you all for uh, the great uh, uh, questions and comments so far really appreciate it and uh, Look, let's get back to Karen's email here because it's really interesting. As I was 
saying she uh, mentioned that uh, she uh, has no eyesight and so she said she had a bunch of questions so why don't we hop on here and answer because uh, I think that probably if someone is free from the distractions of social media it's someone who can't be bothered by the visuality of pop-ups anyway and uh, notifications and so forth although certainly buzzing could be involved there so Karen if uh, you're, you're watching this then I would love to uh, to hear from you if uh, you are uh, in any way uh, your memory is suffering from social media in in other uh, other aspects and con and, and context but uh, so Karen asked to get to her wonderful questions and the first question is great I, I, she says I'm wondering what you think is the most stimulating or powerful sense next to sight I read through the magnetic memory method worksheets and listened to some podcast episodes about creating vivid imagery. I'm not sure how, you, how that you read, if you, and I'm not sure how you're typing this, but maybe you have uh, one of those great softwares that can read text, um, which is cool. You know, I used to work at the Learning Disabilities uh, Laboratory in, um, uh, or lab, we called it. It wasn't a laboratory where we studied people, but we helped people with learning disabilities at York University. And they had really cool software, even back then, that could read text and and create audio for the text so um, maybe there's something like that anyway she says thankfully I found you mentioned a couple of suggestions for non-visual people in most cases my imaginary pictures pop up in uh, a second and associate themselves with the pieces of information I try to memorize but the majority are blurred and colorless like decades year old TV screens or watered paintings with the result that they vanish out of nowhere or remain obscure after images that cannot be decoded later on. So to make my associations firmer and more unforgettable, I'd like to try some other alternative strategies making use of other senses besides sight. Really great, great question. And you know what? This is a beautiful question to really focus on here. Why? Because it's the question that already has its answer in it because so much thought has gone into the question. So it's very easy to answer. I mean. First of all, you just try different things and you figure out your own modality preferences and strengths. So for me to say uh, what is the most stimulating or powerful sense next to sight, well that requires that, that sight is for you already the most powerful, which it is not for some people. For me, sight is not the most powerful thing in uh, all the possible sensations. It's actually maybe the fourth in my learning hierarchy. My sensory modalities are much more geared towards sound and to um, concepts, right? And so it's, it's one of the great strangenesses and possibly failures of memory training and memory trainers for thousands of years, actually, because it's in Aristotle as well we have used the language of the image, the image. Well, Aristotle had the wax tablet, but uh, it still has a kind of image-based uh, conclusion to it that it's all tied up in imagery. But this is not really the power uh, that, that we're talking about. We're actually talking about a combination of things. So the first thing is, is to figure out what is your preference of all the possible sensory modalities, and then once you have a better sense of your preference and you can place them in a hierarchy, start working on mixing them. And that is really, really what it sounds like you're already doing in your description, so that's fantastic. And uh, the more you're off social media, the more time that you have for this. And uh, the less of all that twitchy culture and, uh, and uh, madness with, uh, with Twitter. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, a, that's a, a great thing. Now the second question that Karen has here is, could you recommend some books that include buildings and locations that are well constructed and vividly described enough to use for my mind palaces? Novels, poetry, and travel books are the main source of my memory palaces. Your recommendations would be immensely helpful to populate my memory palaces. The more detailed it depicts in the images, uh, in words, the better I can establish one. That's it. Thank you in advance, and I'm so looking forward with great excitement to your upcoming lectures and hoping to take your Magnetic Memory Method Masterclass someday. All right, from South Korea. Um, well, listen, uh, this is a great question, and books that include buildings and locations, I can't think of one that's better, although unfortunately it's not very word-based, 
is the 13-story treehouse, which I'm reading right now. I really think it's uh, it's lovely. Um, uh, White Noise by Don DeLillo comes to mind. Uh, apparently, White Noise was uh, is referencing strongly a uh, chemical disaster that happened in the Toronto area. And so when I read it, of course, I was reading the... Um, reading it, imagining that area, because that's where I was from, and I was actually in that area when I read it. But White Noise has some very well-described locations, such as the narrator's house, the university where he works, even the car that he travels around with his buddy, and then there's a disaster sort of center, and then there is a, um, a doctor's office where, where the, the, the climax takes place. There's lots of cool locations there. Um, I'm trying to think if any other DeLillo novels have this strong sense of place that you could work on. Um, well, nothing comes to mind. Well, maybe maybe Mao Tu. Mao Tu is a great DeLillo novel. I'm encouraging DeLillo uh, a little bit also, and he probably comes to mind because of the whole Twitter thing and Trump and so forth. Um, because he's a he, he he's a great corrective to thinking about what's wrong with the culture that could lead to that. Uh, what else? And by the way, I don't really intend to turn the show into a political thing, but that, the the whole thing there from uh, <laughs> Planet Sims was your name, I think, uh, if I remember correctly. Let's take a look. I'd love to test my memory here. Um, going back. Oh, Planet Sim. Okay, not not plural. Um, the uh, the thing. The thing is, is that DeLillo does have a lot of great locations, a lot of great locations, and and also um, Underworld is a cool novel for that. I'd, I'd also recommend Cormac McCarthy, but the locations there are a lot more abstract, and uh, by the way, I should pick up here the, 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 the wonderful fact that... Uh, <laughs> reading novels is not being on social media and I would highly recommend that your novels be physical books and uh, also read nonfiction even nonfiction that comes to mind that has uh, locations um, oh you know there's uh, there's a great uh, great 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 book that is about the shooting of the the red badge of courage now I read this book before that I was using memory techniques, but if I'm not mistaken, Lillian Ross wrote this. And wow, that's pretty location-based because it's all about the set of a movie. Uh, so look into that. And uh, wow, there's just so many, so many books you could, you could think of that have location-based uh, scenarios. Um, yeah, great question. And, uh, Peyton here just show, uh, has a comment that he loved the locations in Inception. That's right, Inception is not a bad one. I mean, some of those locations are twisting and turning and woo, but uh, <laughs> that would be a good one. I think Breaking Bad was a good show uh, for locations, but uh, Karen is asking more about uh, books that have words. Um, I have a book that is filled with floor plans that were made for buildings that were never built, but that's a very visual book. Um, hmm, that's a really good one. Well, uh, Peyton suggests Lord of the Rings. Yeah, um, I, I've never read the whole thing, but that could be good. The Hobbit, certainly. Uh, I remember that quite nicely. Let's pick up with some of the comments that we have here while I think of more novels. So Planet Sim, got to remember now that this is a... Uh, oh, Michael's here. Michael, great to see you from uh, Cincinnati, Ohio in the US. So glad that you're here. Uh, if Duolingo team considers that engaging a conversation by stating the color of your pants is very important while learning the basics of a language, it says a lot about the app. Okay, yeah. Um, it's a bit like trying to tell Anthony that his magnetic memory method has been useful once, but you can only remember a small groceries list from months ago. Yeah, well, <laughs> that would be useless, right? But we're talking about people who memorize a thousand words in six weeks, a couple hundred words in seven to ten days, and it, you know, going and then memorizing phrases around those words and core vocabulary. You know, in the master class, there's the magnetic memory method vocabulary builder. It has all the vocabulary I would recommend you memorize first. 
relative to what we were talking about earlier on today's call with figuring out your own process of discovery by just getting out there and speaking, okay? So you can use the vocabulary builder, but you wanna use it in combination with building your own vocabulary by putting yourself in situations where you figure out what it is that you need to say. No textbook in the world has that. No flashcard set in the world has that. No app in the world has that. Only situations have that. You've gotta go out there and you gotta get it. And it's the same with anything. If you wanna learn about science and you wanna learn about uh, the, all that sort of stuff, I can read this book until I'm blue in the face, but you gotta go out and you gotta meet scientists and you gotta talk about science with them, right? And then you'll get that stuff deeper into memory. You'll get a feel for it, you get a touch for it. And uh, it's absolutely amazing what happens. And yet, you know, uh, they don't have a deck of cards like I do, but I see all these people all the time. They're just like this with their apps. You're actually missing out on the brain chemicals that come from interacting with humans when you're just lost like that. Now, I'm not saying that uh, people didn't bury their nose in books and, and, and whatever, uh, like to pretend this is a newspaper, uh, when they were uh, previous to apps and so forth. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with just being solo and doing your own thing, but there are brain chemicals that are created through social interaction and the more people are drawn away to a place that actually is creating digital amnesia, the evidence is very strong that this is taking place, then the more people are really missing out, losing out on these chemicals. And you can just see it. You can see a, a class that is maintaining its hold and its power over society and they're not as roped and ruled by these devices. And well, you know, maybe, maybe there's a contradiction in terms there since the current president of the United States is obviously <laughs> apt crazy uh, with the Twitter um, stuff. But th that aside, I mean, a lot of successful people just will not touch the stuff. They stay far away from it. They don't have time for it. They outsource teams to do all of that. And uh, you want to think about social stratification, you want to think about social hierarchies and think about which ones you want to belong to, what you want to do, how you're going to focus your time and are you going to place it in your brain, your brain, your precious brain, the one that you have, only you have it, right? Are you going to place that constantly in a digital context that's full of twitchy people reacting with snotty comments to each other and sharing meaningless single sentence phrases with weird colors behind them and cats and dogs and little twitchy videos and so forth? Are you gonna constantly expose yourself to that? Is it fun? Does it make you laugh once in a while? Sure, but it's brain candy and candy rots your brain, right? So give yourself what I call digital fasting. One day a week, no computers. One day a week, nothing. Just away from it all, away from it all and cultivate something else and an hour a day during the day where you meditate, where you read physical books. People will ask me like, how do you read so much? I'll tell you how I read so much. I sit down and I read, right? Without distraction. And you can actually, through processes of meditation, practices of going and reading and being away from devices, you can actually reduce and condition out of yourself that twitchiness, that like need to open a new tab, have 50 billion tabs open. And by having a good, solid practice away from that stuff, then when you are in those environments, you're much better able to manage them. And you will forget less, because why do we forget? Often it's because we're not paying attention in the first place. It's, it's, that's, just, that's just memory 101, right? If you're not paying attention in the first place, you are gonna forget. There's no two ways about it. So that's uh, just very, very simple. Very simple. Let's catch up on some of the comments here that were coming in. Um, so, Peyton says, Anthony, what about people slash personalities within the locations, like a librarian, archivist, etc., or is that taking one step away from the work of recall? Not sure what you mean, Peyton, but if you're talking about using them to help you remember stuff, if they come to mind, then they probably could be memory tools. So give it a try. Uh, there's no need to use those particular people. However, you could use other people, and that can also be an aid to memory. So, for example, if I were going to use the uh, the 13th story treehouse here as a memory palace, 
it doesn't have to be the two characters in this book that are in there, right? Helping me out could be other people. So that is a cool fact about memory. Um, let me know if you have any other questions. If you've hopped on the call late and uh, you haven't said hello yet, please say hello to uh, let me know where you are, what you're doing, what you're thinking. And if you have any comments about this topic that we're jamming on here about uh, digital amnesia and social media crafting a brain that is not, uh, not uh, as powerful as we would like our brains to be, let me know. Jake, Jake is here, says, my name's Nino. Okay, uh, <laughs> hello Nino, great to, great to see you here. Um, wonderful, how do, you, how do you feel about uh, how your memory is going and, and you know, what's going on with your memory? Uh, I wanted to, to uh, mention and shout out to, to uh, Sunil again, who was on the last call and his story of what he's doing with Japanese is just incredible. So, uh, not sure if you're going to catch this on a on a replay or if you're here now and haven't said hello yet. But uh, another shout out to you. It's an incredible story. He's a great, great user of the magnetic memory method, and uh, I just love receiving his email updates because he is just out there using these techniques, and you know he's making it an adventure in his life and applying and applying and applying and it's just so great he uh, also does med meditating and that's helping and uh, you know it follows up on some of the recommendations of the books that I recommend so for example he told me about reading the memory code by Lynn Kelly if you haven't heard my interview with Lynn Kelly if you haven't read the memory code please do there's um, there's uh, some interesting comments on my discussion uh, with with Lynn on uh, the Magnetic Memory Method website and some people they really don't uh, find so what's so many great ideas in in that podcast or in that book sorry and uh, we follow up with them and talk about them on the podcast and uh, one person in particular Bill who has uh, followed for a long time he uh, had a kind of critique there that I recommend that you read I, I, I think that I think that actually the book is very, very clear about this special device that you could make to help you improve your memory. So check that out. I also want to point out that uh, uh, one of the reasons why this topic is so precious to me is not only because I am working very much uh, or very attentive to, um, to not allowing digital exposure to ruin my brain, and uh, I noticed that my podcast episode on digital amnesia, Five Ways to Stop Google from Ruining Your Memory, has, uh, wow, the most shares on the site. So uh, please uh, check that out. It's magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash digital dash amnesia. Help share it some more to uh, help more people. It's really been popular on LinkedIn, for example. So obviously business professionals and uh, entrepreneurs and just people who are professional enough to have an account on LinkedIn were, were pleased by that. And I'd love to see that message reaching more people because they're the leaders in society and they, they need these skills the most. They need memory skills very, very much to continue to be leaders, to be the best leaders they possibly can be. And uh, let's hear, let's see here. Jake, uh, Jake, who is not Jake, Nino says, I feel like my memory is just full of old sad things, like uh, sad things like old men at sea, let's say, so that we don't uh, have this <laughs> problem. Sad, unexplained memories. Uh, old sad things. Uh, well, I mean, what, what, what do you think that you could do to, uh, to turn that around for yourself? One of the things you can do when your memory just keeps bringing things that are, are, are sad and so forth is just start doing things that create more happy memories for you. And this is one of the other research elements that's out there is that a lot of people are suffering depression from so much time on social media platforms because it's so empty and meaningless. It's not real human contact. I like these YouTube lives because even though I can't hear your voices and I can't say like I used to when I was a professor, you know, hey, raise your hand if you got a question or whatever, uh, you can just interject, you can have a voice and I'll read what you have to say. 
um, and engage with you and so forth. And this is very, very different than all that twitchy stuff. And I really, really like it. But, uh, oh, you guys are having a dirty conversation here. <laughs> How memorable. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, it's, it's, it's incredible what the difference is when we're talking about attention span and we're talking about cultivating a better attention span for us and the starvation in our culture for meaningful extended discussion you know Sam Harris I love his podcast three-hour episodes just amazing and why would anybody want less when you have you know there's a marketer Gary Halbert and he said or at least I heard him quoted, uh, I never heard him say this myself or read it from him, but it was quoted by uh, a guy named uh, Joe Polish. And he said, you know, when people are interested in something, they want it by the ton, right? And uh, it's true, it's true. And social media isn't really giving us anything that's substantial enough to really want, which is why we have this scanning. Scan, 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 scan. Push, 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 push through the media. And it's just, oh, it's, it, it, there's, there's something odd and wrong and twitchy about it, and it's creating twitchiness. Karen is here. Karen, I just was reading your email, and, uh, <laughs> and we went through your questions and answered them. So uh, please uh, check, the, check the replay of this so, so that we can go through it. I was going to send you the link later. Uh, great to meet you here. That's, uh, that's incredible. Um, so happy about that. Uh, let's catch up here. Jack says, is social media destroying you? Watch this video on the topic over social media. Oh, okay. Well, are, where are you watching it? Are you watching it, Jack, on, uh, uh, on, on YouTube? Because I'm not convinced YouTube is really social media. I think it's something different. I think its grounding foundations are, are different. Its heritage, its genealogy is different than social media. It may have taken on some aspects of social media, but it's, it's quite different, and you can see how it's evolving in, uh, in different ways, and there's a real tension between YouTube and Facebook that uh, you're really aware of if you're a, in, a, a in a position like I am, which is like a 21st century digital media professor uh, who teaches a particular topic, which is, which is memory improvement, which is learning at an accelerated pace, which is having a much better and more successful brain. And uh, it is just absolutely an incredible, incredible experience to be able to have that. But digital media really is carving that away and it's because it's training us to be twitchy. And uh, Harvinder's here. Thank you, Harvinder, for saying hello. I am doing very, very well. Uh, just absolutely great to have you here. Um, I am just excited. I'm I'm very excited, and I want to pick up on uh, on on Jack's uh, point that you know he's watching it on YouTube, and I don't think YouTube is, or you don't think YouTube is social media. YouTube is media that is social, so it's social media. Well. It is, and I'm not gonna disagree that it's social media, but I think it's a different kind of social media, and I think that we would make a very, very big mistake to lump it in as the same thing as Facebook. And in some ways, if we wanna really define this, it is more social than Facebook because it is very, very focused on a particular kind of medium, and many, many, many different things can happen in that medium, but it is video, and it is video that we can use in particular ways that, yeah, we could do it on Facebook, but we have to do it on Facebook in the context of all kinds of other stuff, all kinds of images, all kinds of texts, all kinds of yada, yada, yada. Jack says, I think YouTube is ruining people's lives. Well, please say more. Is this ruining your life? If so, please explain why you're here, because we're hoping not to ruin your life, <laughs> actually. Hoping to guide you to magneticmemorymethod.com to listen to the podcast on digital amnesia, to listen to the interview with uh, Lynn Kelly, to be encouraged to go and read a book like The Memory Code. So if this is destroying your life, then whose responsibility is that? I think that if you're not following these recommendations, that are being given here, which are very wise recommendations. I mean, Dominic O'Brien uh, or O'Brien, 
however, I've, n I've never uh, actually heard it pronounced out loud, but I always like to pronounce it O'Brien because of how it's spelled. Uh, but, uh, you know, he wrote one of the great uh, blurbs on that book, and that that's just a signature that you should be reading it, right? And so Jack follows up here. No, you're not ruining my life. I think people who watch vloggers all day, every day, are obsessed to the point where they don't even speak to their family. Well, that can be, but, you know, it, here's this is the question, Jack, of technological determinism. And I don't know if you've ever heard of technological determinism anymore, or before, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a fallacy uh, in logical thinking. And we cannot say that the machines or the medium or anything like that does anything. So people used to like to say back in the day when cars emerged and teenagers were were uh, were getting into cars that pregnancy went up, right? Because the cars were making it possible for more teenagers to have more sex. But there's not really any evidence that that took place. It, there really isn't. And there is some evidence to the contrary that actually teenage pregnancy went down um, because the teenagers could go and do other things uh, than uh, get into each other's pants. They may have been red pants, I don't know. <laughs> Planet Sim. Uh, <laughs> But uh, th th that's a real problem. And likewise, they said that teenage pregnancy went up when the cell phone appeared. But there's not really any evidence that that is true. Uh, so the idea that any technology is ruining people's lives, is determining their lives, is really, really bad. Uh, you've got to read Jacques Alul, who wrote a book called Technological Society. And um, this is back in the 70s. He basically predicted that uh, the Unabomber would arrive, right? And it was really, it's a really spooky moment in, in, in philosophy. Um, but the Unabomber read that book, and it was sort of his Bible that guided his manifesto. And, uh, you know, if you ever read the Unabomber manifesto, uh, it is a wild ride. Uh, it sounds like the screenplay for The Matrix. So that's interesting to think about in this context. And, you know, The Matrix is a very wise film in many ways, but uh, that metaphor that it's using of the internet and so forth is, uh, is, is not really about the computers. It's, it's, it's a more profound message. It's a more human message than that. Let's catch up with some of the comments that have been coming in here. And uh, thank you all for being here. Thanks for your thumbs up to let me know you're engaged. If you haven't said hello yet, if you haven't asked a question, then let's, uh, let's, let's get your questions. Jack's asking a lot of interesting stuff and saying a lot of interesting things. Um, you also say that it annoys you, Jack, that some people wake up and go on YouTube then stay on it all day until they go to bed. There's a world out there they need to explore. I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. But the emphasis there is on they. And to say that YouTube is ruining their lives is incorrect. It's illogical. They are ruining their lives. They need to get up. Jack continues, also you look a bit like Steven Tyler. When is your next tour? Well, <laughs> it's in an elevator, that's for sure. Uh, so um, let's see, we had another thing here. Rahul, good to meet you, Rahul. Uh, how to tap lots of information and use particular, now information is becoming a mess. Yeah, well, your uh, question is not fully formed there, so please uh, pop it in again if you care to. But yeah, information is a mess, and that's one of the reasons why we can't remember, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to chat with you all about this topic today, because uh, one of the reasons that we are struggling so much is because, you know, so many people figure they got a solution, and then they make a new app, and then a bunch, it's, I mean, it's called swarming. Right? So a new thing comes and then everybody swarms onto it and then they learn all the new procedures for using that new thing and then before it even really gets fully going, unless it's super successful, they're off onto the next thing and they swarm onto that but it leaves all the scattered broken pieces of this other thing which then are getting integrated with this or maybe not and people are bumping into that. I mean you could even still bump onto MySpace, right? Uh, it's an interesting, interesting thing, and there's an entropy involved in all of this. Who knows the word entropy? I, I mean, this is one of the things that I had to learn if you want to have a successful blog like I do, that you can't use big words and stuff like this, right? And uh, that uh, worries me because 
we're being told that people can't understand big words anymore and we're being told that people can't read long sentences anymore everything's got to be maximum 21 words and every video they used to say every video has to be three minutes long but uh, now YouTube wants videos to be 10 minutes long 12 minutes long now YouTube would be happy not if you the viewers so much would be on YouTube all day but that people would just be making all day long videos to up their engagement and so forth so it's, it's, it's weird everything changes and that's part of the reason why information gets so snarled it gets so hard to follow is because they're basically chewing our lives up chewing up our human lives in order to create data and then using that data to really hook more of our attention more of our time to take more and more of it and I'm doing it too I'm part I it's just we're all in it we're all in it right I think that some of us have better messages than others and when people give me the criticism that you know your videos are too long or so forth uh, yeah they're that way on purpose because I'm looking for the people out there who have the attention span already so we can expand it even more so that we can create a society that can still sit still for a meaningful message and because all I got is more meaningful messages for you I want you to read this book that's gonna take some time if you can't sit through a 10 minute video if you can't sit through a 50 minute video how are you gonna ever read a book you know so I am actively going out there and doing all that I can to be a better speaker on YouTube lives I'm practicing YouTube lives this is a big experiment to see what can happen with this because uh, my podcast has been really successful and I don't monkey around I just cannot stand these short form podcasts I know there's a place for it but there's so many of these podcasts they got like a two minute intro then they got about seven minutes of content and then they got a two minute uh, outro and like then you want to listen to another one you want to bulk listen to them you know and you weave them all together with uh, like audiobook builder is what I use and then I, you end up spending most of your time listening to intros and outros this is just junk I'd rather listen to a guy who has something to say for 60 minutes really dives into it listen to Sam Harris who can spin out a, a, a nice conversation yeah it gets a little repetitive here and there but come on you know it, 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 when did we stop being able to deal with repetition Mark says, but there's a difference between being addicted to heroin and watching a funny cat video. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm not convinced uh, that being addicted to funny cat videos is any better than being addicted to heroin. The heroin addict could be someone who's still a good contributing member to society and can be on heroin and contribute to society, but the, some, someone who's sitting there flipping through idiotic cat videos for uh, 12 hours at a time, <laughs> I mean, this is exaggerating, but they're... they're you know, you know, you know where I'm going. I don't, I don't think that's a, I don't think there's that big of a difference actually. And if there is a difference, it's in the favor of the heroin addict. Uh, so let's, uh, let's uh, knock down that uh, to a, to a, to a less, a more reasonable comparison if we can find one. Rosemary's here. Rosemary Rodriguez, the interpreter from Virginia on a cloudy day. Oh, well, cloudy days happen too, right? Do you recommend real books as opposed to Kindle? I learned from you. Well, thank you for saying that, Rosemary. And yes, I do recommend real books. That's why I'm actually purposely, intentionally sharing with you the real books that I am really reading because I want to encourage this. I want to be a, a popularizer of real books again because all the evidence that and the research that they're showing and my personal experience has just been that I don't remember as much from from digital books, ebooks, and so forth. And I think it's really, really important for us to acknowledge that. Now, I'm not saying you can't learn front and remember from digital products. I just, uh, I can't say that because I have learned from digital products and I have remembered stuff from digital products. But I'm saying something a little different, which is that, uh, that we cannot have the same quality of experience and there are a lot of factors at play that prevent us from actually even paying proper attention to information when we're reading it on machines and devices that are filled with distractions whereas book park bench nothing else to do no distractions I, I know that's why I want to promote this idea of digital fasting which is on my podcast digital amnesia magnetic memory method dot com forward slash digital dash amnesia so that you are actually preserving your brain giving your brain space and time to be away from environments that are full of twitchiness that are full of 
destructive things that, and, and are preventing you from having sufficient social interaction, real social interaction, because social media is not social. So um, let's catch up with a few more comments that have come in. Um, Rahul says, you are the best, fond of listening to your podcast. It improves quality of life. Thanks a lot. Well, Rahul, thank you for saying that. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, I'd uh, appreciate you all going and checking out MagneticMemoryMethod.com today, downloading some podcasts, preparing the new one for this week. Last week's podcast seems like it's been pretty popular. Click the share buttons if you care about these messages. And uh, hit the likes and all that stuff. I don't know what it does. You know, it took me a long time to find the find it in my stomach to say, hey, click, click, and all that sort of stuff. But you actually got to do it. You've got to do it because otherwise this positive message doesn't spread. And there's just so much negative rubbish out there that it uh, takes over and people are all too happy to uh, share, share share that all around. But we need, we need more of the rationality. We need more of the royal road to to reality, which is what uh, Michael Shermer is arguing for in this book. And I highly recommend you read it. Um, I'm really, really pleased that uh, Rahul likes and supports the podcast, and I, I just hope that you all will get on board if you care about this message. And if you don't, don't, and you're critical about it, say something. Let's make it better. Let's get together, do something cool for the world. Don't, don't you know? There, there's criticism, and then there's guidance. Okay, and I, I, I take guidance. The whole reason why this camera is so still now is because people said, "Hey, man, you, your, your selfie stick is moving all around." So I did something about it for you guys. I, I respond to your criticism, so keep them coming. NC says, I wonder if I could organize memory palaces by using the, de the universal decimal classification. Uh, it is the system used in libraries uh, to organize informational books. One can classify all info with labels. Yeah, or you could use the imperial system. Uh, I can send a link with an image. Yeah, sure, that'd be cool. Dr. Sira Pop is here. Oh, great to have you here again. I love listening to you. I'm still studying cards. Card on, man. It's really, really great for your brain. It's so much fun. And uh, I really, really love cards. And you know, on a previous live, I had uh, shown you a great book that I'm reading. Uh, so if you didn't catch that, uh, you can hear me talking about that book and some of the cool things about card memorization. And so um, cards are cool. Cards are really, really cool. And you know, I did some card magic today, and you know, a little memory stunt the cards, make it entertaining, make it in, uh, fun for people, and just use your mind. Use your mind. Be a person who has more than one skill. That's what memory techniques can do for you. Uh, it's, it's something that I think is really, really important because so many people are putting all their eggs in one basket. They're trying to become a master of one thing, but they're studying it in, in twitchy environments. And I'm going to keep using this word twitchy because this is what I think is the best word for this. Uh, and they're just, they're, they're, so much time is being lost on not being able to focus on one level of mastery when actually you have the potential, if you could figure out how to use your mind better and your memory better, to become a master of multiple things. Because I can go, if push comes to shove, I can go play music for a living. I really can. And if push comes to shove, I can go and do card tricks on the street because I have mastery of that, right? A certain level of mastery. If push comes to shove, I can go teach German. If push comes to shove, I can go do all kinds of things, teach film studies. If push comes to shove, I can go teach English literature and poetry composition and essay composition and so forth. You want to be a master of many things, but how do you get there? Well, it's pretty simple. You train your brain, you train your memory, and you enable yourself to save time so you can develop multiple levels of skill. And those multiple levels of skill will ensure that you never go hungry, that you never go thirsty, and you don't have to fear anything or anybody. Now, fear doesn't go away. I mean, existential fear is there. There's all kinds of fear, different levels of fear. And uh, yeah, Alex is here. Good to see you, Alex. Yeah, this is a really, really, really beautiful deck of cards. I got this deck of cards in London when I had Magnetic Memory Live in London, which uh, Ollie Richards helped me put together. If you don't know Ollie Richards, go to IWillTeachYouAnguage.com, you'll love it. And uh, yeah, we put that together and everybody who came, all the attendees, they got a, not this deck, they got a magnetic steel colored deck for attending. And uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. I'd like to do more lives uh, eventually. Really, really fun to meet with people. And uh, uh, Alex says, does the pattern have a name? Yeah, it's a contraband deck, so that's what the box looks like. 
and really, really beautiful cards. I should actually reach out to them and say, hey, uh, you want to sponsor my channel? Um, <laughs> that would be great. Mark says, London, England, that's where you live. Oh, well, it's one of my favorite places in the world. And uh, we just watched a, a movie called A Street Cat Named Bob, which uh, made me think very strongly of London. I have so many memory palaces in London. I love London. It's such a great city. All right, guys. Well, uh, that was a great session. I really appreciate you all engaging to the level that you did. Hit those thumbs up. It's not too late to uh, let me know you were engaged. You can always come back to this. If you need to find my YouTube channel, just go to magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash YouTube. It'll take you right to the channel. If you're not subscribed, subscribe. If you want to be notified of these lives and you're not being notified, hit the bell and uh, that'll do that for you. And most importantly of all, come support the work at the, at the headquarters at magneticmemorymethod.com. Uh, today I really want to promote this amazing, amazingly successful post and podcast called Digital Amnesia, Five Ways to Stop Google from Ruining Your Memory. And I'm going to keep talking about this problem of digital amnesia because it's very serious, it's very real. We need to contend with it. We're paying the price for it individually, culturally, politically, and it doesn't have to be a price that we need to pay. And the truth is, we can have the best of both worlds. We just need to find the the golden mean, as Aristotle would call it. So read the uh, Nicomachean Ethics if you don't know that. Now, I want to thank you all for being here. And one last little recommendation for you. If you're as concerned as I am about these issues, and you know, not concerned to the point of hysteria, but concerned enough to get on the machine and, and have a chat about it, then I highly recommend you see a movie by David Cronenberg called Videodrome. If you like to make movie memory palaces out of movies, then uh, that would be a good one because there's some really memorable locations there but it's also got a lot of weird images not uh, not uh, for children not for people too young but uh, definitely if you are an adult and you ha have the consent of yourself uh, as an adult then go and check out Videodrome because it uh, it's actually very interesting there's a character there named Professor Oblivion who appears on TV only on TV and he talks about how the uh, television is the retina of the mind's eye and all this like weird stuff and uh, <laughs> it's really cool it's a really cool movie and very very prescient for what's going on today so that's by David Cronenberg a Canadian director Canada where I'm from and uh, he made a lot of cool movies but definitely Videodrome is the one to see and uh, yeah if you're watching this contraband cards I might hit you up see if you want to uh, you know uh, whatever you call it sponsor my little uh, video cast show here Thanks everybody for being here. I really appreciate your support. If you'd like to support this work, you can head over to magneticmemorymethod.com, take the free course. And uh, if you just want to jump to the chase and go to the store, then that's there for you as well. You can hit products on the main page or go straight to magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash store. And uh, I really appreciate all your interest. And you know what? This is the fifth year anniversary of me doing this full time. And I'm really, really excited to be celebrating it because that's a long time. <laughs> that's, a, that's a real long time, and it's because of the support of people like you, if I can uh, put it that way, which I remember seeing on PBS a lot when I was a kid, watching, you know, Bob Ross doing his painting and stuff, and Mr. Rogers and all that, and I think those things had a real good, solid influence on me, and they certainly were shows that you needed to have an attention span to watch, and they cultivated an attention span that has lasted, and uh, I would sure love your attention span to not only last but develop so that you can hold extended conversations of great intelligence with other human beings and not be all twitchy and not be all looking at your app all the time because if you're going to look at something this size or thereabouts make it a deck of cards memorize it exercise your brain thanks everybody for being here and uh, Karen thanks for that that email and thank you all I got a I got a motor because of a uh, computer curfew and computer curfew is coming up in just a few minutes. So that's all from the Magnetic Memory Method headquarters here in Brisbane. Hope, uh, hope to see you soon at magneticmemorymethod.com. Till we have a chance to speak again, keep yourself magnetic. Bye-bye.